Today we want to talk about Nepal and Bhutan. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, uh, the speaker from from Nepal. You know that uh, we have the bio, so I will not be uh, uh, long-winded. Dr. Nichal Pandey is from uh, Nepal. He is the director of the Center for South Asian Studies uh, in Kathmandu, and uh, he will have a, a very interesting PowerPoint for us to to think over. And from Bhutan, we have uh, Mr. Taji Dorji, Taji Dorji from Timpu. He's the editor of uh, Business Bhutan. Business Bhutan is a Bhutan is a small country, but with just a few newspapers. So he's an editor of the Business Bhutan. But before we start off with Nepal, uh, let me in invite uh, Professor Supachai Yavaprapat, uh, the dean of our faculty, to to welcome to provide a few welcome remarks. Welcome the. Uh everyone uh, to this Im important forum, the uh, public forum on government and politics in Nepal and Bhutan. Uh, this is uh, one of the public forum that uh, ISIS uh, have been doing for I think a number of years already, uh, at least since uh, my leadership I have witnessed uh, this uh, public forum, which uh, for me, it is very uh, informative, very useful, and I I hope that uh, everyone will uh, see it in the way that uh, I see it. Uh, for this uh, particular uh, public forum, uh, as mentioned already by Dr. Titinan, we have uh, two uh, speakers uh, from uh, the one from Nepal and one from Bhutan, and I think you will uh, enjoy the insight uh, from both speaker and and also uh, what Dr. Titinan have in mind is that uh, maybe uh, this will uh, inspire you to, to to think more about actually about Thailand. Uh, this uh, public forum uh, is supported by uh, the Stiftung Foundation. So I would like to thank Stiftung for, for this support. And also would like to, to thank uh, Dr. Titinan Tin and his team to uh, make this uh, public forum uh, possible. I also would like to thank all the, the audience who, who come here I think you, you have something in mind and, and you will get what you wish to get after uh, this uh, two hours. So uh, with, with that note, I would like to uh, again welcome all of you and wish uh, the forum the, the fruitful and the successful. Thank you very much. So this forum today, we don't mind um, lighter attendance and uh, light uh, media coverage. Something, uh, we have YouTube here, so we have the video um, upload. It will be available on YouTube. Uh, so this is something that we want to promote the discourse on the role of monarchies in democracies and the role of uh, constitutions in democracy uh, in combination and and in balance. First, let me go straight to uh, Dr. Nichal on Nepal. Nepal, you know, the, the, the number one question people have about Thai politics is what happens in the near future. And uh, the worst case scenario, in my view, I used to say this uh, all the time, is that, you know, we don't want to become Nepal. So, Dr. Nishal will tell us uh, 
why that is the case, I think. Uh, Michelle, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Titi Nan. Uh, uh, thanks for your kind invite to share some of my thoughts on the uh, Nepal politics. Thanks also to Dr. Supachai for your welcome address. Now, let me acknowledge that I, that I have no or little knowledge about Thai politics. I'm only going to speak about Nepal, which is my country. And uh, if there is any resemblance that is purely coincidental. Nepal, as you know, is the birthplace of Lord Gautam Buddha. And once upon a time, it was also known as a zone of peace. We were never colonized in our history. There were various wars with the British. The British could take over the entire Indian plateau, but could never take over Nepal. So that remained a very proud history of Nepal. And basically, we maintained our independence because of our Shah dynasty, the royal family, which was, when it started 250 years ago under King Prithvi Narayan Shah, the first Shah king, he was a soldier. He was a, a, a battle-hardened soldier, the first king. And we fought it, British movement into the north, north of India. So we remained a sovereign country, independent country throughout history. We were also known as a zone of peace. In 1990, there was a constitutional monarchy established with a multi-party democracy. Unfortunately, in 1996, the Maoists, which is an extreme left ideology, started a Maoist insurgency in Nepal. And uh, by the time it was 2006, it had already killed uh, more than 16,000 people in, in the insurgency. So that, that was a really a turning, turning back uh, towards a uh, civil war situation in which the army was mobilized, uh, the political parties were unable to tame that insurgency. We also had gross political instability. Uh, we were perhaps the only country which has had 19 prime ministers in 19 years. So nearly one, one prime minister every year. So that contributed uh, to political instability. Counterinsurgency operations uh, was fraught with massive human rights abuse. Uh, we first used the police and then uh, what happened was that the police weapons fell into the hands of the insurgents. So the insurgents were getting battle hardened and experienced. Then we erected a separate force called the armed police force, a paramilitary battalion. And then that was also unable to tame the insurgents. And by the time we used the military in 2001 and declared a state of emergency, the insurgents were already very familiar with the terrain, whereas the force, uh, the state security force, was, was just beginning to learn counterinsurgency. So this was uh, basically a dilemma uh, in, in 2001. And when the military moved into the insurgent area, uh, it used to clear off, uh, apply clear off operations, and it used to kill people. So most of the time, the innocent people got killed. And the villagers also then started seeing the military as the enemy, whereas the Maoist insurgents as a liberator. And therefore, that was another dilemma. Third, because of poverty and malgovernance and corruption and political instability, the people thought that perhaps the insurgents are better as uh, liberators of the poor people than uh, than the political parties. By 2006, no side emerged victorious. Of course, the Maoists could not overrun the state, but the military too could not solve the problem. So it was a no-win situation. And in a typical insurgency situation, what happens is that the insurgents win the battle by not losing. The army loses by not winning. So by the time the time goes on and years pass by, people get fed up, people get frustrated, uh, the military loses because of rumors and campaigning and, and these days the social media and so forth. We were also a Hindu kingdom till 2006, the institution of monarchy was a Hindu monarchy and you know there were some groups, some factions, some people that said that we need to be secular 
because we also have Buddhists, we also have Muslims, we also have Christians. Although we have 80 percent, uh, 8 zero, 80 percent as Hindus, uh, they did not want the institution of monarchy to be symbolized with a particular religion. That also contributed to the whole thing. The military was, uh, it was of a strength of 35 to 40,000 before 1996. It went up to 90,000 by 2004, but that also was not uh, able to uh, tame the insurgency. Contributing factors were difficult terrain, we are a very hilly mountainous area. Uh, there was an unreliable supply of weapons and ammunition because the Nepal army is very much dependent on the supply from the Indian army. And that was very erratic and irregular because of uh, various reasons. We also have an open border with India. Uh, and the insurgents crisscross the territory of India and Nepal. And uh, our experience has been that if you want to tame an insurgency, you need all the neighbors on board. And if any of your neighbor is having a double game, you cannot win the insurgency. They have to be on board. And uh, what the United States is doing in Pakistan with drone attacks is precisely that. That you need to go into the, the, the neighbor's territory. Because the insurgents use that territory to, to shelter, to raise funds, to garner support, to lobby, to send emails and fax. So they are not in your territory. So mobilizing your army makes no sense in your own territory because the insurgent leadership is not staying in your territory. It's staying in the neighbors, neighborhood. So that was another problem. And as I said about political instability, our political parties they are democratic, they were elected by the people, but there were various scandals. All prime ministers have had one corruption scandal or the other. Now they are more focused on uh, retaining their chair, retaining their position than to solve the problem of the people. And that also contributed to uh, the, uh, the Maoist uh, gaining strength in, in, uh, in, in the country. As I said, there is there was also no consensus among major political parties on how to deal with the situation. Uh, there was also a culture in Nepal that every political party would petition the head of state to remove the prime minister. And the head of state would be inclined to do that, oblige that, and select a new prime minister. So that created a sort of a anomaly in the democratic system. And also that because of political instability, there was no policy uh, formulation which, was, which had a consensus backing of all the major political parties. And we are seeing that today. Uh, unfortunately, Nepal today does not have a parliament. It does not have a, con a full-fledged constitution. And we have uh, no elected local bodies. Uh, the problem was that we dissolved the, all the elected local bodies in the year 2001. And that also became very beneficial to the insurgents because there was a complete vacuum in the villages. Uh, when, when they were elected people in the local, local villages, they used to be uh, the service providers. So when we dissolved them, the problem was that uh, there was a complete vacuum in, in, the, in the local bodies. As I said, the institution of monarchy was a very respected, popular institution. Uh, it survived for more than 240 years and it is, a, it is, one, of, it is one of the oldest uh, monarchies in the world. Uh, unfortunately, there was also a royal massacre in the year 2001 in which uh, the crown prince at that time killed uh, all the members of the royal family including his own father, his own mother and uh, nobody could find out. There was a judicial commission formed and it identified as the crown prince who killed the royal family. Uh, the only surviving member of the royal family was uh, the brother of the king, uh, King Ganendra. And uh, he was uh, never trained to become king. Uh, he was a hotelier, he was a businessman, he, was, he never thought that he would become king. So he became, uh, assumed the throne in the year 2001. His uh, intentions were noble, in which he said, how can a king remain a spectator when the country is burning. And there was a lot of royal courtiers and privy council members and generals of the army that said, how can his majesty uh, remain silent when the country is burning and when the political parties are doing nothing? 
when the Maoists are taking over the countryside. His Majesty has to do something. You are the guardian of the constitution. You are the, you are the last hope for this nation. And that was the trap, basically. We realized later that the monarchy's most reliable shock observer is the Prime Minister. But the royal courtiers never thought of that. They always blamed the Prime Minister for not doing anything. They always blamed the Prime Minister for being anti-monarchy. But that was not the case. You may have a very nice, sophisticated Mercedes-Benz, but that car also needs a shock observer. Without the shock observer, the impact is going to be on the engine. And the engine is the monarchy. So, His Majesty listened more to the courtiers and the military generals who urged him to act in 2005, first in 2002 and then in 2005. A state of emergency was declared and the king sacked the prime minister and the political party leaders were arrested on corruption charges and and by the way, there were a lot of corruption charges on politicians, gross misuse of public funds. And the Prime Minister at that time, Prime Minister Koirala, was, was unpopular himself. But the King acted without a shock observer. And what happened was that the political parties joined hands with the, with the insurgents. The biggest loser became the institution of monarchy. His Majesty also had at that time a big dislike for, for certain politicians and justifiably so because the politicians, as I said, were only focusing on forming and dismantling governments and there were big telecom scandals and corruption and these days telecom sector is becoming so large and millions and billions of rupees is, is, is in that sector and there was a big corruption scandal against all ministers. And so therefore, when His Majesty acted, he did not have the support of the political parties. He only relied on the army. The army cannot fight in two fronts. That has been our experience. The army cannot fight an insurgency and also fight in the capital city. The army cannot fight with guerrillas and also fight with political party leaders at the same time. The army, our army was very well trained. It was trained in Sandhurst in the United Kingdom. It was trained in Pacific Command in Hawaii. Our generals are very well educated. They participate in regional conferences and international symposiums. They are not fools, but they are also loyal to the crown. Unfortunately, what happened was that the military was fighting too many battles at the same time. It was also fighting with political party leaders in Kathmandu, and he was fighting against the guerrillas in the village. It cannot fight two battles. So when the two got together, the monarchy became the victim. And when the people's revolt happened in April 2006, the military tried to control the situation with tanks and with clamping of curfew and arresting leaders, but it was already out of hand. The major political parties agreed to abrogate the 1990 constitution. The 1990 constitution said that there will be a monarchy and multi-party democracy in Nepal. The moment that constitution was removed, the monarchy was removed. There was also a comprehensive peace agreement signed in November 2006, in which the political parties decided to bring the Maoists into the mainstream. And the insurgents were very clever in accepting the, uh, the multi-party democracy. They laid down their arms, but they did not lay down all their arms. They only laid down those arms that they had confiscated from the state security. And that was verified by the United Nations. 19,000 People's Liberation Army cadres and 3,000 of their weapons were stored in United Nations monitored cantonments. Till the time of monarchy, we did not invite the United Nations to solve our insurgency. Because we thought that we are an independent country, we have never been colonized, why should we bring the United Nations to, as a third party mediator? But after the monarchy was removed, we brought in uh, the United Nations and uh, the ceasefire was declared. 
We had also had a problem with uh, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince. Uh, again, he was never trained to become Crown Prince. He was a prince only. Uh, he had a good life. Uh, uh, he was uh, also involved in businesses. And uh, there were a few incidents uh, involving him uh, which had... Uh, uh, it was basically got to do with hit and run incidents. So he used to go to a party and uh, he used to drive himself back home. And uh, once what happened was that uh, he ran into a motorcycle uh, which was being driven by a singer, a very popular singer. And uh, the singer was killed on the spot. And and he, the crown prince was driving the jeep. Unfortunately, it was dis it was later found out that the motorcyclist was at uh, uh, was to be blamed because he was on the wrong side of the road not the jeep it was the motorcycle which was wrong but he got he got killed and the driver of the jeep happened to be the the crown prince of nepal so that got into the media and uh, the media was stopped by the police uh, but there were rumors and now rumors are very powerful weapons these days the people send sms text messages they go to facebook Twitter, social media, and we tried to convince the people that this was not the case. He was not to be blamed, but who believes? Uh, as a crown prince, he should not have driven that jeep himself. There are so many drivers in his palace. Uh, so that was a big problem. It happens for the second time, uh, and the third time, and then we were in a very PR dilemma. So it was a public relations disaster. But we were fortunate to have a very popular crown princess. She's a princess from Shikar in Rajasthan in India. She's charming. She, she speaks very well. And she, after the fall of the monarchy, she opened up an NGO called Himani Foundation. And that foundation supports uh, poor people and runs health camps in rural areas. She takes cardiologists and doctors to villages and, and runs these camps. She told, told to the media that it does not matter for me whether it is monarchy or republic. I do whatever I want to do. Whatever I have been doing, I'll continue. So she became very popular, actually after the fall of the monarchy. Because she said, I don't care. I just serve the people of Nepal. And so the problem at that time was, we had a very unpopular crown prince, but there were popular members of the royal family. Uh, but who would tell his majesty that uh, uh, it was better to have a heir to the throne as a small baby or the princess? Who would dare to say that to, to the king? So that was another problem inside the palace and because of that we made a historical blunder of um, having an unpopular crown prince uh, as a heir to the throne but popular members of the royal family were not heir to the throne. So that was a big disaster. There was some, and you have to realize that there, this, there were some foreign forces also. Uh, uh, extreme rightist elements in Scandinavian countries and certain areas of Europe and America that wanted to see Nepal as secular. Uh, since we are a Hindu kingdom, there were uh, extreme uh, rightist elements uh, that said that uh, Nepal should become secular. Uh, so that was another problem because there were a lot of NGOs and INGOs working in Nepal to defame the institution of monarchy. So that was another case which we realized later. And we also realized that royal courtiers do more disservice. So to clean the image of the crown prince, we had publications, magazines, various brochures. Nepal Airlines was doing so many works. And uh, His Royal Highness the crown prince used to go to the districts. But that was not working because the people are very smart these days. Young people, you know, they go into these social media. But we had a very popular other members of the royal family, which we were not using. So that was, a, it was a basically a palace disaster. It was a, a palace courtiers made disaster. Then we had the fall of the monarchy in 2008 and we had a constitu constitution, uh, a constituent assembly elections in April 2008. Uh, for the first time in the history of Nepal, uh, the people of Nepal elected a constituent assembly because all the previous constitutions of Nepal were given by the king to the people. This, is the, this was the first time when the sovereign people of Nepal 
elected their own parliament to draft our constitution for themselves. It's, it fulfilled the 57-year-old promise of the people to being allowed to choose their own destiny. There was 60% voter turnout, 80,000 national and international observers, including President Carter and uh, various international renowned figures came to Nepal. Nepal has already had five constitutions in the last six decades. So this was a real hope that uh, finally we would settle down. And to everybody's surprise, the main Maoist leader won the election. The Maoists surprised everyone and became the single largest party in parliament. All its top leaders uh, triumphed. They secured 120 seats in direct elections and 100 more in proportional representation. So in a, in a parliament of 601, uh, they were the single largest party. Uh, Mr. Prashanda, the rebel leader, became the first prime minister of, uh, the, of the republic. And this was a great surprise to everyone because uh, this party had uh, effectively been the cause for killing 16,000 people of Nepal. And how would this party be winning the election? So therefore, uh, then we realized that the party had also done social changes in the rural areas. The villagers were actually in support of this political party. The villagers basically wanted a change. They had seen monarchy for 250 years. They had seen political parties for 14 years of misrule. So they wanted a change. And the main slogan of the Maoists was, you have tried everybody, now try us. And it was a very catchy slogan. You have, you have, let's try us, you know, vote for us. So they won uh, the election. But sadly, what happened was that the parliament was a hung parliament. It, it became a hung constituent assembly. Uh, the Maoist was the largest party, but they were not having majority. Uh, so they were trying to get support from other smaller parties to form a government. The constituent assembly was reduced to a regular hung parliament, uh, again, busying instead on forming and dismantling governments. And it could not reach consensus on the issue of federalism. This was what the scene looked like in 2008 during the election results. All the red color is uh, going to the Maoists. So there was complete sweep of the Maoist party in the, in the elections. And only smaller uh, areas in the, in the southern areas of Nepal bordering India that the Tarai parties uh, came victorious. Another development in Nepal was that the uh, ethnicity and religion and all these things came into the picture for the first time because the monarchy was a lid in a can of worms. Once we removed the, removed the cover and all the worms started coming out. And uh, then we became a multi-ethnic, multi-religious country. And uh, then there was politics on the basis of ethnicity, which is very complex. Uh, the Tarai parties won substantial amount of seats in the southern belt of Nepal, bordering India. And uh, unfortunately, that is also our main industrial area, bordering India. There was loot, there was blast, there was abduction and murder. And that has been going on since 2007. The southern areas of Nepal are unsafe. That is very unfortunate uh, what is happening. There is extremism in this area. Uh, there is cross-border connections with criminal groups in the neighboring Indian states. When we were a Hindu kingdom, there was never Hindu fanaticism in Nepal. We were basically a secular nation. But when we became secular, then Hindu fanaticism is also on the rise. Uh, in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, in India, there are a lot of extreme rightist Hindu groups. Uh, they are now targeting Christians. And a blast occurred in the Church of Assumption in Kathmandu in 2009, done by a Hindu fanatic uh, that killed several people in the church. Muslim fanaticism is also rising. Since now we are a secular nation, uh, madrasas are being built, mosques are coming up and uh, there are Christian mercenary organizations that are active in proselytizing people into Christianity and uh, that is creating another, another form of problem. The saddest part of everything is that despite of the fall of monarchy, we have not stabilized. We have had five prime ministers in the last six years of republic. Uh, the constituent assembly was dissolved in May 2012 
after not being able to draft a new constitution. So at, at the moment we don't have a constitution. So we can technically say that uh, the monarchy has been declared but it has not been established. We can clearly say that uh, we have declared ourselves as a federal country but it has not been introduced in the constitution. There is trade unionism and the Maoist high-handedness continues. They confiscated a lot of property of the so-called petty bourgeois and capitalist class but they are yet to return the property. You know, The home minister could be from the Maoist party, the finance minister could be from the, finance, from the Maoist party but they are still abducting and asking for money from businessmen and from doctors. They, they have to return back the confiscated property to the villagers. So people are seeing this uh, dual, uh, dual state edifice in Nepal. Whereas there is a state, there is also a parallel state in which the, the trade unions, student unions, the youth organizations of the Maoist party still function. And that has been, uh, that has been one, of the, one of the problems. We are basically back to square one because there is no constitution and no parliament. And there is also gloom and pessimism all around as all vital institutions have been vacant and crippled. Uh, uh, the military basically is all right because uh, the army is basically a bureaucracy. Uh, cleverly, the political parties did not touch the army when the monarchy fell because they knew that there would be an immediate backlash from the military. So very cleverly they only removed the monarchy but they did not remove the generals and the chief of the army staff and they did not remove anybody from the, from the Royal Nepal Army. They only removed the word Royal. So before we used to have Royal Nepal Army, now we have only Nepal Army. They were, that was very cleverly done because they knew that a 90,000 strong force would, uh, would have immediate reaction against uh, the political system. So they did not touch uh, the military. So the army today does nothing. Uh, it just sits and watches as, as the nation burns. There is also an ill intention on the part of Maoist to, for a totalitarian state. Uh, they have been visiting China and visiting North Korea and, and uh, they have a vision to, at least one faction of the Maoist party has a vision to transform Nepal into a a very egalitarian, very socialist model of, of, of system which nobody in Nepal wants. Because why should we go into communism in this 21st century? Former King Ganendra pulls big crowds when he visits the countryside. Uh, it has already been six years since the Republic was established and he visits temples, he visits uh, the countryside in rural areas. There are hundreds and hundreds of people that want to meet him. But the irony is, where are the military generals? Where are the Privy Council members? Where are the royal courtiers? They are nowhere in the picture. The people are there. So the king's best friends are actually the people of Nepal. That's what we have realized. All these former advisors have gone away. They have withered away. Uh, but the king still draws crowd when he visits the countryside and meets people, asks for their grievances. Uh, so that has been another experience that we have had. The United Nations has been fairly successful as far as uh, bringing the insurgents into the, the mainstream. And uh, at least 3,000 of the PLA have now been inducted into the Nepal army. And that was uh, the first time it has happened in South Asia that a former rebel group has been inducted into the state security forces. But the Nepal army has continuously said that we don't want politically indoctrinated, ideologically driven former guerrillas to come into the state security forces because they are going to spoil the others in the basket. So they will have to go for a retraining for about two years, uh, combat training, commando training, uh, complete uh, brainwash, and they have to be disciplined uh, to become a, a soldier of a nation and not a soldier of a political party. So right now they have already been inducted into the Nepal army but they will have to go through this period of uh, period of education and retraining uh, that will that will have to be done. The United Nations uh, the United Nations mission in Nepal Anmin has left after it's finished its duty. 
the never ending agitations continue there is uh, the maoists are very good in trade unionism and and uh, creating problems in every state industry and every every business the business men are fed up with this with this bunts and strikes we also have 18 hours of load shedding during winter some of you may not even know what is load shedding load shedding is power cut we are a country with 83000 megawatts of hydropower but the mao is uh, some of these groups have uh, bombarded hydroelectric projects so we have to now sit in darkness for 18 hours a day in during the winter time for 3 months there is no electricity there is only electricity for 4 5 hours a day so that has been that has crippled the industry uh, we have become more unstable after 2006 because as i said there is no constitution and no parliament so when there is no parliament there is no parliament hearing committees so we cannot appoint constitutional body members we don't have a chief election commissioner Uh, so there are various vacant positions in in, uh, in 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 Nepal. Our exports are down. Our industrial output has gone down because of basically trade unionism, strikes, and uh, also because of power shortage. Our, uh, we rely very heavily on tourism. Uh, tourism is very important for our national economy, but that also gets hit uh, because of strikes uh, done by one political party or the other. but one thing is doing good that is remittances sent by our workers working in malaysia and working in the middle east we have a lot of nepalese working in middle east and malaysia they send money back home to their families and that has been sustaining our economy looking back monarchy is best when it remains in its ceremonial role uh the moment monarchy does wants to do more and try to solve all the problems of the country then it becomes a victim its support base are the people and not the army and that's what we have uh, we have realized uh, which is very unfortunate political parties also must realize that the removal of monarchy in the last 30 years in any country has resulted in extremism and not democracy the prime ministers the ministers the political party leaders politicians must also realize that monarchy was removed in the last 30 years in four countries iran cambodia ethiopia nepal and all, in all these four countries it was not democratic political parties but extremists that came to rule so that is the sad part of the story in iran there was a shah dynasty the shah of iran he was removed and what came after that was a extreme variety of islam run by jihadists by 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 fundamentalists the women of iran have to walk around like black ghosts and at at one time they were tehran was one of the most fashionable places in in the middle east cambodia and you know very well about cambodia the monarchy was removed and so many thousands of people were killed and the khmer rouge came in power in ethiopia Ethiopia was a stable country in Africa it was one of the most prosperous states in Africa when king hel selassie was removed ethiopia went into civil war and famine and nepal i i don't have to say say anything about it unless politicians shape up changing of the political system alone does not does not do good any good at all you remove one system and bring another system but the actor remains the same the politicians remain the same the style of functioning remains the same monarchy or republic we are in the same condition so so we have learned a very bitter lesson out of that also this is the birthplace of buddha in lumbini i hope no country in the world goes through death and destruction as nepal has seen in the last one decade thank you very much for listening I'll be very happy to answer questions. Uh, this is a very insightful uh, presentation. You've said some things that I think we can relate to here. Uh, you said something about the insurgents win by not losing. The army loses by not winning. And I think that we can see in the deep south in the southern border provinces of Thailand we have a an insurgency a Malay Muslim insurgency related to that you said that um, you need neighbors need, need neighbors to tame an insurgency 
Uh, and I think that that's something that uh, has been on the minds of Thai uh, security planners, that I think we need the cooperation of Malaysia. Another thing about the army, you said that the army cannot win to, on two fronts, that uh, to fight against the insurgency and then yet again fight at the same time in the capital uh, is very difficult. So let me just ask you, um, Nishal, just a follow-up quickly. Where did things, it looks like a, really a cautionary tale, a, a tragedy and a predicament in Nepal. Uh, where's the way out? And before that, where did things really go wrong? I mean, now it looks like a pendulum that swings wildly and cannot find a resting place. Where did, the, if you were to pinpoint, was it the, uh, when the Crown Prince killed his family? Or was it uh, when they abolished the 1990 constitution? If, if the Nepalis were able to retrace the steps, where would they have uh, made a different point of departure? Point of departure, we have had too many points of departure. But I think number one, uh, Dr. Titinan, if I would say, is that, yeah, 2001 was a point of departure because we had a very popular king, uh, extremely popular, His Majesty King Virendra. And uh, he was ruling for a very long time, uh, since 1971 to 2001. So that is already 30 years that he was in, in the throne. And he was very popular. But the thing is that uh, he was not involved in active politics at all. So uh, after 1990, he assumed a constitutional role and he remained very popular. But the royal massacre changed everything and uh, people saw that uh, the institution was also not divine because we also thought that the king is God. And Nepal, a lot of people still believe that the king is God. Uh, King is Lord Vishnu. A uh, lot of people still believe that. But how can the son of God go and kill his entire family? Then the youngsters, younger people started debating about it. And uh, so the palace at that time should have realized that the prime minister is very important for the institution of monarchy. The pri like in Britain, Queen Elizabeth has seen so many Prime Ministers since the time of Sir Winston Churchill. But there has never been a problem between the head of state and the head of government. At least it does not come out in the open. Whatever happens, happens privately. But in our countries, the problem between the head of state and the head of government is open and the royal courtiers become holier than Pope and uh, they start giving grievances about the king we had one Privy Council member who went to meet the Prime Minister and said, His Majesty is very angry. Now, what authority does this Privy Council member have to say that His Majesty is angry with you? To the Prime Minister of Nepal. Because the Prime Minister is supposed to be the shock observer to the King. And whatever grievances does His Majesty have should be communicated to the Prime Minister directly because they have a weekly meeting on Thursday. We used to have it on Thursday evenings. And that used to be not publicized to the public. So whatever happens between the head of state and the head of government should be very private, should be very uh, confidential and free and frank discussion. But we had certain army generals and Privy Council members going to the Prime Minister and saying, you are not doing good. And we also had certain members of the political parties going to public and saying Nepal should become a republic. So that created a lot of fissures between the head of state and head of government. It happens even till today when we are a republic. So the president and the prime minister is, are having problems with one another. So in this context, we must learn from certain European countries where there has been a very good relations, personal relations established between the head of state and the head of government. And that is, I think, we have realized is very important for the stability of a political system. The Prime Minister may be corrupt, the Prime Minister may be unpopular, the Prime Minister may be anything you say, anything bad you can say, but the Prime Minister is the Prime Minister. He is the shock observer of the King. Uh, he will be there when push comes to shove, when it becomes very difficult. But when you remove the Prime Minister, then you have nobody else to, to support you. Uh, that has been a sad part.